Something I've been theorizing about for a while when it comes to these solo runs is the speed at which a mounted unit can complete the challenge. And I truly believe that because of their superior movement, they might end up coming out on top and doing extremely well. And today I set out to test this theory and see if it's possible to beat Fire Emblem the Sacred Stones using only Franz. The rules are as follow, hard mode, no grinding, no cheats or exploit allowed, one potion per map, and no use of the convoy to grab more healing items. However, the convoy is is not off limits to grab more weapons and other kind of items I may need for the map itself. So before we get fully started, let's address the elephant in the room. If I wanted to test out this theory with mounted units, why didn't I just go for everyone's favorite unit in Sacred Stones, Seth? Well, that's because I have a certain theory regarding pre-promoted units that I want to keep for the run using Seth. So therefore, to keep today's premise simple, we want to complete this game with a mounted unit. So we're going to be using friends who I'm pretty sure is the second favorite mounted unit of the community. At least that's what my recent community poll says about friends. As is customary with these runs, I'll have the first few chapters play in the background as I break down friends' base stats and growth rates. So let's get into it, shall we? When looking at friends in a vacuum, the one word that comes to my mind is average. His bases aren't bad, but they aren't crazy either. With 7 points in strength and speed being standouts, those stats are quite good for his starting unit level 1, to be honest. His speed won't make him double right away, but he'll be able to do so after a few levels. And when you look at the growth rates, this narrative is pretty much maintained. Friends is no horrible stat. Also, he doesn't have anything fantastic per se. It's all kind of average or a little above average. Even in his speed growths, as you can see, where he quote unquote excel, there's still like 10 other characters in the game that have superior speed growths to him. But to be fair, this can all be explained quite simply because you see, Franz, like most Cavalier in the GBA games, falls into the category of more of a generalist type of unit. A jack of all trade, if you will. This is the case of most Cavaliers as most of their growths will be around the averages with maybe one standout stat in certain cases. While some of our previous runs focused on more specialist types of characters with Roz being strength focused, Loot being a glass cannon and magic focused, Gillian being a tank being a defensive, specialist. Here we're going to be looking at a unit that's more generally well-rounded. The general reason Cavaliers fall into that more generous role is because of their high base movement. They have a base of seven movement on the map, which is two more than infantry unpromoted units. It's a really good starting base for movement that allows them to dominate the map. So you can kind of see their more generalist jack of all trade approach to them as a way to keep them a little bit more balanced. Because if you gave them like crazy skill growth or crazy speed growth or strike growth or whatever it is, they would just outshine everyone else. Because why take a warrior, for example, if you can just take a cavalier that is going to have the same strength and can move seven spaces? Well, with that being said, it's important to mention that Franz is probably one of the most beloved love Cavaliers in the game and generally considered the best one right after Seth. I would even go as far as dubbing him as Seth Light. Well, the reason Franz is considered such a good character is, other than the fact that a well-balanced character like Franz is always a super reliable unit, getting him very early on in the game allows him a lot of space to grow. But something that makes this character stand out is when you compare him to his counterparts in the game, this being both Kyle and Ford. And I'm not talking about growth comparison here, because as you can see on the screen, their growths are quite equivalent. Ford excelling in skill, Franz excelling in speed, Kyle excelling in strength. This is a little bit more to do with their base stats. You see Franz begins the game at level 1 as we've already seen, whilst Ford and Kyle begin at level 6 and 5 respectively. But if you compare those starting stats one beside another, with Franz having 4 to 5 level less than his counterparts, his bases aren't that much lower when you look at it. He is 7 strength, which comes to be the exact same as Ford, but 2 less than Kyle, which that is significant. However, he has the same base speed as Kyle with 7, and only a single point under Ford, who was 8. And he's also 1 point under Kyle in skill, not that far behind, actually. They also virtually have all the same resistance, one or two. Where the other two will outshine Franz though will be in their luck, defense, and HP. But in the grand scheme of things, in the more offensive stats, Franz begins in such a better place than the other two comparatively speaking. 
So that's going to give him a leg up generally in the eyes of the player. Better availability with really good growths and speed makes friends usually a pretty standout unit in any run. With all that being laid out ahead of us, let's see how friends is currently doing. As you've probably seen in the gameplay in the background, he doesn't struggle. He doesn't know what the word struggling is at the early stages of the game. His mastery over the weapon triangle, his ability to double quite early on in the game for level or two under his belt, because of his decent constitution and good speed will absolutely cause him to roll through the game. So we won't have much to talk about in the early game. You know, we'll be picking up the keys on chapter three, but we won't use them, we'll keep them. We'll also grab the Draco shield, the secret book, and the the armor slayer on chapter 5 because those are your more useful items. The latter isn't super necessary but I do use it to take out the boss on this chapter so I guess it's somewhat of a useful pickup. As per usual chapter 5x is the only one we skip over since we can't use friends here so we'll be using whoever we're given and we'll grab the keys on this chapter 2 for later use. And finally we get to chapter 6 which isn't a hard one because we're majorly over leveled but it's a chapter where we finally hit the max level 20 for the cavalier class so let's break it down and see what we have to play Play with here and honestly our friends isn't anything impressive which is something that could have been guessed through the growth rate it's all kind of you know i hate to say it again but average which by the way isn't a bad thing average isn't bad it's just nothing standing out and i might even go a stretch further to say a little below average and i'll explain my thinking here so let's look at friends's most likely expected value in each stat given his growth rate you may think we're actually quite close right given that his hp is above what you'd like to see and most of his stats are right around the average given that we have 17 speed over 16 and such you know everything looks in the right place the only stat that is underperforming really is strength by like one point one and a half point maybe you have to remember that's that's not entirely true because we did use a draco shield and a secret book which both upped our defense and skill by two so if you look at those stats and where they should be without the items you're only hitting the average or the most likely expected value because of those items so you're a little bit behind where you'd like to see friends be so that's why i say he's underperforming a little because his strength defense and skill could be a little bit higher but it's nothing really dramatic because we're doing pretty good in hp we're within the averages on speed res and luck so you know as i said not too dramatic it's not what you love to see but it's nothing unexpected with a unit whose growth rates are in you know 50s 40s from run to run with a character like friends there's gonna be discrepancies there's gonna be a lot of different combination of stats you're gonna see okay so here's a little experiment i really like to do often is i'm gonna pull up seth starting bases because i want to show you guys why i often refer to friends as seth light so as you can see those are looking kind of similar you know friends is overperforming seth in both hp and speed but when you look at the strength the skill the luck the defense you're kind of seeing right about the same values of course friends is doing i would say overall better than seth because seth is only outperforming him and you know a little bit in strength but mostly in his resistance and his luck but both characters tend to become pretty similar with friends kind of having a little bit better speed and seth having better defense and better strength usually but it always reminds me that they way over tune seth in this game and, it, and it's it's awesome but man is that character too good but moving on the next chapter after this is chapter 7 which we're not going to talk about too much but we will be talking about the night crest that we're going to be getting because we have to defeat murray to get it right after we'll be able to promo into either the great knight or the paladin let's talk about it all right when it comes to paladin and great knight honestly both classes have their upside at first glance you could say that the great knight is a great option if you're simply looking at the promotion bonuses you get one more point in hp strength and speed than the paladin does all the while getting access to axes which allows you to dominate the weapon triangle and two more points in constitution which will allow friends to heal whatever weapon he wants with very limited speed penalty or not at all but through all of this there's one glaring stat that is looking at us and it puts all the great knight's advantages to shame and yes of course i'm talking about movement so if you go great knight your movement speed actually drops to six you lose one movement while the paladin is raised to eight you gain one movement. so essentially you have to weigh in sacrificing one movement for all these generally inconsequential bonuses given that in a normal run having one more point in speed and strength 
strength isn't a make or break for the run because you have other characters, more factors, more things coming into play. And Franz as a paladin gets to 11 constitution, which isn't bad at all. Most weapons will be okay for him within that class. But if I've learned anything from solo runs, you can't just look at the promotion bonuses. You have to go dig a little deeper to understand what class you would truly want. So let's look at the next part of the puzzle, the stat caps. Honestly, I'm looking at them. The difference aren't major and I'll explain why. The Great Knight gets a max cap of 28 in strength while the Paladin is 25. So three more for the Great Knight and the Great Knight gets a stat cap of 29 for defense while the Paladin is 25. So four more. Those are big in and of themselves. Like they can be significant. But on the other hand, the Paladin gets a stat cap of 26 for skill while the Great Knight gets 24. And the rest is all the same. The reason I'm saying they're big, but not in this case really, is because some of those stats don't really matter for friends. The odds of him even coming close to 24 without items is very low. And there's no way in hell Franz gets even close to 29 in, in defense. That's not happening. Unless you have an extremely blessed Franz, it's not happening. But with that being said, there's something we need to remember. And if you've watched any of my previous runs, you know that due to the nature of how we set up those runs by switching out Erica for the character we're currently using, we're forced to go through Erica's route. And something that makes Erica's route easy for solo runs is you get the drop of two energy rings which means you can add plus four to your strength total and in turn that means that the great knight class seems a little bit more interesting all of a sudden let me tell you why well when you, we look at franz's level 20 averages or most likely outcomes in the great knight class he's going to be around 24 maybe a little bit lower 23 but there's a likely outcome that it'll be around that 24 mark so that means that the energy rings that we get the plus four that we get would make him cap his strength or come close to capping it and honestly that would make a pretty big difference in the final boss fight but to be fair even that doesn't fully convince me for the case of the great knight let's look at the final thing that we have to take into account before making our promotion and that's the legendary weapons the first thing i want to note here is is whether Franz goes Paladin or Great Knight, none of these weapons that he can use will incur any speed penalty to him, which means that Franz will most likely double the final boss because he'll be right above that, that 23 point threshold you need to have that four plus speed over the final boss. When you look at his averages in speed, Franz maxes out speed at 24 very quickly. Ours is already at 17, so we don't have much to get there. So we can kind of expect to get close to there. So when looking at the weapons comparatively, it's really hard to not have Garm come out on top. Just in a vacuum, it has the highest damage and it gives you plus five speed. One could make an argument for both other weapons though. Given that the plus five defense of the Daphnir is nothing to scoff at, it does increase your survivability overall. And as we saw in the Gilliam run, using the Daphnir is not necessarily bad because you do manage to soak up a lot more hits. And the Adalma gives you a plus five resistance, which does in turn help fight Leon and chapter after 18 altogether just for survivability on that chapter which is probably one of the apart from the end one of the hardest chapters in the game for most units but when it comes to the Dauphiner, there's one stat i absolutely hate and it's that 15 might it's really shockingly low and it's hard to justify so for me it does come down to either garm or adalma since france should naturally double the final boss you may think that garm's plus five speed isn't valuable but as i said earlier it does affect your avoid which means that it does in a way increase your survivability and that's good for the final boss you want to put all the chances on your side and make it as reliable as a fight as possible as you know if you've seen the loot run you know that re reliability is super important in that final fight you don't want to have to bank too much on luck while adalma may help for certain characters or certain map in the game with the plus five resistance but adalma's plus five resistance doesn't really provide an advantage against the demon king since he attacks with physical damage so garm when looking at the final fight because that's the map you'll usually be using your legendary weapons on garm does come out on top so at the end of the day here i think garm as a legendary weapon is the better option of the three 
but the thing is France can only use it as a great knight. So with all that being said, all that being laid out, are all these little micro advantages, because I have to say it, all the things I laid out for the great knight that are advantages are very microscopic in terms of what difference they will make. In a solo run, these advantages will have a bigger impact. All these things that I've just said, if you have more than one character, you can throw them out the window. They're not worth shit. But for a run where you're alone, they do come and have some type of worth because normally the higher movement of the Paladin trumps everything. I truly think that is Franz's best class. And while I fully intended to go Paladin when I started this run, looking at those stats makes me want to go Great Knight because yes, the lower movement is going to suck, but the possibility of more damage, better avoid are gambles I'm willing to make if it means losing a little bit of time. So we go Great Knight and sacrifice at one movement speed and make quick work of chapter eight as it's quite easy. You have to go to the left hand side to get the reinforcement before Ephraim's group gets attacked. And then we go back to the right side, pick up the angelic robe despite Franz's 80% HP growth. He's not likely to max out his HP naturally. So getting that boon is nice. You want to get it. You don't want to take any chances here. We do end up using the armor slayer on Tirado. You know, we missed a couple of the hits. We lose a little bit of time, but I, I guess there was some usefulness in picking up for real at this, this point, you know, it gave us that little oomph. And here comes the route split. And as already mentioned up top, we'll go into Erica's side. I already laid out the reasons. It's because we switched out France for Erica. So we got to go on Erica's route. Let's take a quick look at chapter nine together because there's an item I never talk about on this map that can be quite valuable to grab. I'm talking about the Draco shield, which is in the left hand side house. This house typically just gets destroyed by bandits. And I thought that by using France, I could finally save it, but as you can see, it isn't the case at all. I'm pretty sure if we'd gone Paladin, this would be a little different. So something to keep in mind. But I, I think it's something we'll find out at a later date if Paladin allows you to save that house. I think it does. I also end up recruiting Amelia for her speed wing, even though Franz doesn't need it at all. I think it's just a force of habit at this point. I think I wasted a turn on doing it because I'm just so used to doing it. So, you know, it is what it is. And as you've been seeing, Franz doesn't struggle at all for any of the maps. And it's going to continue in the mid game. The run is really overall uneventful. He isn't bad at all. He kind of methodically makes his way through each map, but doesn't do anything extraordinary or worth highlighting. He just does the thing and he does it very reliably. He's just reliable. So I'll break down the significant little things that we do up until chapter 15 here. So chapter 10, we pick up Tethys at the end. So we use her goddess icon because that's always fun to have a little bit more luck. Chapter 11, we grab the secret book in the chest on the right hand side. On chapter 12, we will recruit Ewan from that one house and grab his energy ring. And chapter 13, as per usual, we'll make extremely quick work of it in like three turns. It's it's such an easy map. On chapter 14, we'll go through the bottom path. Usually we go to the right hand side path, but this time around we're going to the bottom path because we will be picking up the energy ring in the chest on our way to the boss. We're also making a little detour on the right hand side by breaking that one wall that's, you know, broke and they can break through. The reason behind this is twofold, simply because if you go through the left hand side completely, you will spawn shaman reinforcements and Franz's res is nine points at this point in the game in his stats. That's so not great. So you can I want to avoid magic damage if you can. I'm not worried that they'll take me out, but I, I'm not taking a chance. You know, we're playing it safe. The other reason is I'm trying to grab the spear that Renak steals every time, uh, but I do fail in doing that because I, I forgot to equip a ranged weapon when I broke the wall. So the knight just stood in the way and, and blocked me. So yeah, I lost that weapon, but that's fine. We'll move on without it. Finally, we make quick work of Carlisle using the sword weaver we picked up from the one, one warrior earlier that we just killed. So that's, that's cool. All right, it's time for literally the worst chapter for anyone in this game caught riding a horse. Chapter 15, everybody. We start by possibly doing the biggest waste of time ever. We go to the right side of the map and try to pick us the Metastome. And I don't know why my brain did that because at this point I'm fully aware that it's not super useful. It's not super great at this point in the game since I only have like two levels to grab. If I'd have more levels ahead of me, it would be useful. But with two more levels, the odds of the Metastome doing anything significant are very low. I just kind of waste my time there. So that was kind of an oversight by me. So I take a million turns, do that. Then we have to grab the Swift Soul in the center of the map, which takes us a million turns to get there because we were moving by one. And then it takes us a million turns to get the Swift Souls because we can't move quickly and our luck is kind of shit. So finding things in the sand isn't great. 
Oh, wait, let's back up a little. Look at Null. Look at Null. Look, look at him go. He's dodging. He's out here dodging full like in nobody's business. You go, my boy. Do it again. Do oh, yeah. That, that about ends there. The poor bastard. You know what we always say here? Bye-bye, mm, Null. So, yeah, let's get back to business. This map is literal hell. It's hell to move through. It's easy overall. None of the enemies are scary. It's just tedious to walk through. Do so, by the way, just uh, being a, the best meat shield in the world for Ephraim over there. Just holding on to Ephraim, protecting him so I don't get a game over. We, you know, we stand. We stand do so. Even though I've been on this map for a long time at this point, I end up still trying to pick up the body ring, which there is somewhat of a usefulness to it. I get up to 15 constitution with it. There's not a lot of items previously friends couldn't use or had a speed penalty to attach to them, but now we're pretty sure we don't. Not sure it was the best investment of time. That map was just so boring. I think my brain melted in my head while doing it so i was just going through the motions because i just wanted to get through it and it just took too long oh yeah by the way we also one shot valter take that you scum that's super satisfying but let's move on to chapter 16 and i'll be honest i did get a game over on that one because i was being very dumb and i was trying to bum rush horson and, and see what happened on our second attempts, things go much better. We manage to grab both the talisman and the tomahawk. We're a little bit more careful and we get out of there scots free. But we have reached Franz's final form. So let's uh, take a look at it. And it's super disappointing. You may be wondering why I'm saying that. Because at face value, setting at 24 skills, speed, and strength is really nice. And with a pretty cool 21 defense to boot, you love to see that. Because that's way above what's expected of his growth. And even his skill, he caught up from when he was earlier in the game, even using the secret book. No, the disappointment is based solely on that 24 in strength. So as you guys remember from like five minutes ago, one of the main reasons for going Great Knight was the higher potential in strength, the higher cap of 28. And remember when we look at his average stats at that level, Franz was around 24 before any of the item. And if you remember, the Paladin's cap was 25, only one point above where we are currently sitting. So overall, this means that in 20 levels, Franz got five stat up in strength from leveling. The four others came from the rings and two came from the Great Knight promotion. He underperformed a little bit on that end, his growth resembling more like 25%. So that kind of blows because we didn't get a high roll there and it wasted one of the few attributes that Great Knight has over the Paladin, making this in retrospect the wrong choice because we could have kept the movement. We would have gotten about the same strength, maybe one less. You know, that's given that the same level ups happened. That's not going to happen. But given that fact, and maybe we could have pushed above the 24 in skill since we capped it. Maybe there was a chance there. You know, at the end of the day, you know what they say, hindsight is 2020 could have never guessed that to happen and i'm exaggerating a little friends is still really good here we still have a good friends all in all you just got a little bit strength screwed like just a tiny bit at the end there all right moving on to chapter 17 which is quite a breeze we get to traverse over the hill with this class so we can make it to leon really fast and we take him now with a nice tomahawk crit which you love to see and here is the map that every character with bad resistance absolutely hates. Chapter 18. And, you know, Franz is no difference. Having only 12 resistance, he can struggle here. But we'll use our good old strategy. We'll be trying to take out as many eggs as possible early on. And then we move to the bottom most side of the map. Again, this is because it will force the Gorgons to walk over all those fire tiles to get to us. And then maybe one or two ends up perishing there or having very low HP so we can easily take them out. The good thing with Franz is his high speed will make him have an easier time to dodge over a lot of the other units as you can see the stone is about 20 percent ish chance to hit instead of what we're more used to seeing which is around 30 percent ish depending on the character so that's an advantage it's going to make it a little bit easier than for other characters but even then the damage if it hits is quite high and annoying so you kind of want to hope for the best here something i wanted to touch on quickly about the gorgons has to do with the use of ranged weapons a few of you have been commenting why i don't just use javelins or ant hacks on this map well, the reason is some, not all the Gorgons tend to favor not getting counterattacked. What I mean by that is if you have a ranged weapon equipped, the Gorgons will always go for the stone first. Somehow their AI just doesn't like getting counterattacked. And the second thing they'll prioritize after survivability is damage. 
Meaning that if you have a melee weapon equipped, they will hit you with their damaging ability before they try to stone you. That's the reason I equip a melee weapon usually when the Gorgons are around. Because since a stone is virtually a game over, I would rather get hit by a damaging ability than stone and have to reset all over again. It's as simple as that. So once the bottom section is completed, we move to the upper parts of the map. And as you'll see here, I'll try to take out this one Gorgon here before the other one on the side. The reason being that one will move to try to attack you. So I take it out quickly. I'm not too scared of the other monsters around the spider gets critted you know the other spider doesn't get critted but also dies and this guy with the heavy spear could do some damage but you know critted into oblivion then we go attack the other one because this one just doesn't move so you want to try to take it out as quickly as possible here we'll take the battle axe to do so and it's out so that that one's the big one here then we'll place ourselves in range to try to attack one character at a time hopefully the the evil eye i place myself there i equip the hand axe i'll pure water to avoid Avoid as much damage as possible, but the point is to attract the evil eye and oh, wait a minute. Ah, uh, god damn it. Okay, so what happened here is I didn't check and I thought I was out of range of the boss Gorgon who has a better hit rate than all the other Gorgons. And I had the ant hacks equipped. And as I said earlier, she goes for the stone and they murder me eventually. So I made a mistake here. It was a placement mistake, but it happens. Unfortunately, it does happen. So let's try again. So we do a couple more runs and I never make it back there again, you know, because there's a certain level of luck that is required for this map to work properly. So you have to try a few times. Okay, we're back. Let's try this again. We'll place ourselves a little further back. That way we're sure it's only the evil eyes and we'll elixir because we're a little bit low on HP and hacks. Kill the evil eyes first. We get hit. That sucks. But the evil eyes aren't really a problem. So here we'll go for the main Gorgon who hurts the most. And we'll use the Tomahawk to do so. Because I want to make sure she never gets on stone. Because the ones behind her, I think only one of them move. And the rest stay static. And 19 chance to hit. We're good. Yeah, the shadow shot is going to try to hit us. We're fine. We dodge. And then it's, it's, it's an evil eye. Evil I could hit. It's not too bad. But here we're still looking good. We have four more Gorgons to take out. Everything around doesn't matter. So I'm looking which one do I kill. And we go for the one who's going to move with stone. The other one's probably going to do damage. Oh, the other one moved forward and does damage. We did dodge that. I forgot about the other one down there. We dodged that second one. That's great. And the shadow shot. We also dodged. Okay, now we should actually be in business when I think about it. So after killing this gargoyle of the horse slayer, which could have been bad, we'll be going for the gargoyle below us because the one that doesn't move is in attack range. So she will be prioritizing attack. It seems that the one that don't move have a different AI than the ones who do move. So it's very weird. I have to figure out the Gorgon AI. It's super odd. It's hard to keep track of. But as you can see, we make short work of this map. Everything is good. Everything is easy peasy. It took me a little longer than usual. This map truly has the potential to be a roadblock. So time for chapter 19. And you can usually approach this one simply by grabbing Mansell and sitting on the throne. But here I'm looking to make quick work of it. So this map can generally be done in almost three to four turns if you're quick enough with your movement. So I aim to do as I did with loot and I aim to rush Reeve to take him out. And as you'll see now on the screen, I do. It isn't too tough. All right, moving on to chapter 20. We face the same issues we faced before. It's a map with a lot of forests and a lot of reinforcements. So moving through it can be slow, but none of the enemies are that much of a stress. They're kind of easy to press on through through and just beat it's not a problem but other than the magic users nothing is too scary and you know even on the topic of the magic users none of them provide too much of a challenge we can usually heal up the damage or dodge most of the attacks oh and here comes reeves and he shouldn't be too much oh well that was a crit Ah, kids, here is a lesson in always carrying the Hoopland Guard around. No one is safe from annoying random crits. Okay, let's do this again. And oh my god, we just get stoned right off the rip. That's a load of bullshit, man. By God. Okay, third time's the charm, I guess. Let's skip right ahead to Reef. And this time, still without the Hoopland Guard, for some reason, I literally don't learn from my mistakes. But we did dodge. Okay, we finally decided to equip it better late than never, I guess. And we get a 
secret of our own. How does it feel to get a taste of your own medicine, Mr. Reeve? I, I guess I did kill him before, so he got his revenge on me. Then I got my revenge on him getting his revenge. You know what? It's very complicated. I win. You die. All right, more of a time. We'll use the dragon axe for this one, even though Garm was clearly a saver bed, but you know, I'm on autopilot at this point. We do get hit. We're very close to dying, but Francis is hinging it out as a dodge machine, so it doesn't matter one bit. And we get to finish it. And the final test is finally upon us. Time for the final chapter. Let's see if Great Knight France can inch it out for us. Okay, so let's skip all the skeleton and our first test here is the zombie dragon and let's check it out. Dragon axe 30 damage, Garm 34 damage, but it's the hit rate I don't like. The lowest we can get him is 61%. I'm not gonna bank on dodging this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hang back, equip the spear and let him come to us. That has worked in the past. We dodges and we get a crit. Okay, that is pretty nice. So I think with Garm or the dragon axe, we can take him out two hits and it gets the job done. Let's go, we hit and we get hit this time you know, was kind of predictable given the fact that we had dodged a 61% chance or 71% chance, I think even. You're not gonna catch me complaining here. Well, let's skip ahead, you know. We fight all the skeletons, we fight the death goils, and there's that one pesky death goil, the Axe Reaver, who is kind of an annoyance. They hit me three times, so I take some damage. I have to use an extra elixir eventually. We go to the right, we take out the spiders and even one of the gorgons, which does make us an opening to Leon. So that's pretty good. So as I usually do with my first run I usually go straight for Leon there I don't bother in taking out everybody around him I like to play with fire a little bit and just kind of bum rush him and go right for the throat but as you can see we pull out Garm here and that's just 18 damage on him with 7% chance of critting and 68% chance of him hitting us it's not looking great we do grab a pure water though, just to be safe. But if you look at the killer axe, it's nine damage, 37% chance to crit, but nine damage, 78% chance to get hit. We'll pure water and wait it out and see what happens here, but I don't have a lot of hopes. So come at me, boy. He's gonna hit me here for sure. Yeah, that's what I thought. And we don't get one crit. Okay, let's dodge this one. Dodge, that's fantastic. Let's dodge this one, dodge crit let's go let's take those gorgons out hopefully we'll be fine if it's so high 43 it hits 43 percent chance okay stone oh my lord yeah that was to be expected so bum rushing here will not work at all sometimes it works for this character for friends it doesn't work we need to be a little bit more methodical we'll have to readjust our strategy here but we don't make it back to leon for like two or three more tries because you can see the zombie dragon he's kind of a mini roadblock here because of his piercing damage if we don't dodge he can two shot us so unless we get a good dodge, which by the way is hard because that's like 70-ish percent chance for him to hit. So we got to adjust our strategy. So we can't rely on a crit dodge combo, but we can maybe get a dodge if we're lucky or maybe get a crit. So the strategy I start employing is just attacking him straight up with Garm, just bum rush him with Garm. It gives me the best possible avoid with the extra speed you get on it. And it just makes it a little bit more reliable. All right, let me show you how this goes down. So we go right up to him, and as you can see, 59% chance to hit. We might get to dodge. We hit him once, and we dodge. Okay, we hit him twice, 15 damage. Here, that's a perfect scenario, because next turn, he might attack us and hit us. That doesn't matter. We'll be able to go kill him right after, because we have the damage for it. So that is what we are looking for. We take him out. And then we'll take out everybody around him and move on to Lyon. So we make it back to Lyon having used only a single elixir. And here, as I said, we'll take a more methodical approach than we did earlier. And we'll start taking out his gorgons around him one at a time. So we'll start out with this first one over here. We'll enemy phase. We'll let this other one attack us and we dodge. Okay, the shadow shots are going to be going to need to be taken care of, but we dodge them. The demon surge one will come and attack us. We dodge also very nice 43% attack chance that we dodge. All right, now we got to take care of the shadow ones one at a time and then the stone one. So there's now there's only virtually one that's going to attack us. So that's really great. Let's hope we dodge it. We get hit. Okay, that's a little bit more annoying. We get hit here, but 
We'll go take it out, and then the doggos will attack. The doggos won't miss, unfortunately. We do get a nice crit here, which is nice on the last use of the hand axe. And then we have Garm equipped, so that guy's not going to last long. We do get hit here. We have two elixirs left. I would have liked to not have to use the elixir, but we'll have to use it a little later on. We'll start by taking out the two other gorgons. So once the final stone gorgon is taken out, which we're going to be doing with Garm right here, very easy kill. Now we can move on to Leon, who's alone. That's always the best way to approach this fight, by the way. I never really approach it from this angle. We do heal here, but I, I usually kind of bomb rush him. You should always prioritize taking out the enemies around. The least less attacks that go towards you, the better you're going to be feeling. So, you know, that's just my tip. I never follow it because I'm a dumbass. So what we do here is we're going to equip the Killer Axe again. We're going to try to bank on the Killer Axe crit on the weight. We'll pure water right now but we'll really use the killer axe for the crit that's what we're banking on we need some crits we need some luck so you know even though the damage is lower let's hope for a crit 36 damage that's gonna miss us okay we don't get a crit but we get a very clutch dodge so yeah since we dodge we adjust our strategy and we go okay let's use garm and let's focus on maybe having more dodge chance and increasing just our overall damage that we do because we won't kill him and we'll kill him in like four shots here but you know it allows us to increase your avoid and hope for the best so he's gonna attack us to 67 percent chance to hit and we dodge let's go okay and we get a very clutch eight percent crit all right first time demon king baby let's test out this bad boy over here everything is looking good garden 28 damage that's pretty good 78 percent chance to hit it's a little bit more scary but 55 percent chance to get hit so we had 45 percent chance to dodge we don't dodge the first one but he spawns his enemy and what are we looking at here? Two zombie dragons. Okay, that's not right. I'll take a step back because those two zombie dragons are a little bit more than obnoxious. What we'll try to do is we'll slowly bait the demon king away. First of all, we'll take out his crony, so we'll get out of his range to take out all the cronies around him. And once that's done, since our HP is still above the damage he does to us, we'll be able to tank a hit to kind of bait him one pile at a time away from the dragons to then go and attack him. So here we wait and we hope for the best 55 percent chance to hit he hits us with two hp auto that blows oh god i didn't think about that guy he could hit us that's 10 percent, but you know it could have happened so here the demon king is still in range of being defended by the dragon so what we're going to do is we're going to take another step back and we will elixir right here and again let him step forward we can take two hits i would i would hope something would dodge at some point we've been hit twice three times now let's go oh we get hit again that's three and three he's three and three on the 55 percent chances that's not good for us but now we're out of the range of the zombie dragons okay friends go for it you can dodge okay we have to dodge at least this one or the counter attack so we hit that nice let's not miss by the way and we oh i get hit again we're at four hp and he is eight okay it's now or never it's now or never people let's go please dodge let's go we dodge okay that means friends wins friends wins come on friends take him out let's end this shit i oh that was so close he hit us with 455 percent chance can you even believe it but first try demon king dear lord this wasn't perfect but it goes to show that being patient did come in handy in the end despite everything i'm pretty happy with the great knight choice because i truly believe garm's speed boost ended up making a huge difference in that final fight yes we got hit four times by that 55 but having that 55 percent chance to hit instead of like 65 probably changed a lot for us i also think a case could be made that a dalma given how much of a roadblock leon was could have been a really great item to pick up here but with that being said but let's look at how well friends did in terms of turns and time well my man hit 389 turns which makes me think he could have easily challenged for loot in terms of turns if it weren't for the desert map i believe we may have outshone loot in terms of turn however in terms of time he did not do better than loot with nine hours and four minutes which is still really good he outshines every other solo run we've did so far 
but he was still an hour slower than loot. So that's kind of significant. However, he did not need any resets. We're in kind of a peculiar situation here. In terms of ranking, this one is tough and simple because clearly Friends is number two. He's better than everybody under loot. And I wouldn't go as far as putting him above loot because clearly he did worse than her. So Friends is clearly the number two character on the tier list. That's not a question. But where it becomes complicated is, is in terms of tier. Would I include Friends in the same tier as loot? Because the turns are quite close. Friends is no reset. But the time, there's still an hour difference there. Or is Friends his own tier? Because he's not in the same tier as Ross for sure. He did the game in better time, about an hour, but a lot less turns too. We also did make a point throughout the video that I was wasting a lot of time with dumb decisions on my end and the great knight switching there instead of going paladin there's an hypothetical world i think where france could be number one or very close to it or even in the same tier as loot because my brain went autopilot a few times i did not expect any of this to come any close it's really hard to say but i think we're gonna move france in the second tier and then move ross down and create another tier just for france i think loot would be considered ss tier and france is s tier at the moment we're gonna readjust a little bit i really thought we would start shoving people in the same tiers but this one is very peculiar very close in turn but the time is quite significant and at the end of the day, this list is far from being scientific. As you guys know, it's not scientific at all. I just do one run or as close to one run as possible and hope for the best. But yeah, there's too much doubt around it. I'm just going to put Franz as own tier. He's the second ranked. He did really good. And there's a lot of factors that are hard to take into account. So with all that being said, thank you for watching. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Let me know how you thought about it in the comments. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you like this kind of content. I try to do a lot of Fire Emblem content. I have a lot planned for the future. But I've kept you guys long enough. Have yourself a wonderful rest of your day, wonderful rest of your week, wonderful rest of your month, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay tuned and uh, bye bye.